Hey guys, welcome back. Last episode, we checked this engine for damage while it was still on the pallet. We didn't see any, so we cut it off the pallet, got some of the stuff out of the way, and went ahead and checked compression. While it was hanging on the cherry picker, I had 160 to 165 in all cylinders except for one that I had about 130. After cranking it over for a while and doing all the other cylinders, I went back to that one. Compression went back up to about 145, but it's still quite a bit lower than the other cylinders. So I want to take some of the stuff off of this engine that I need to take off anyways, including the intake to inspect the knock sensors, make sure there's no water down in there. And then the coils, the wiring harness, and then I'm gonna pull that valve cover and we're gonna verify that the rocker arms move about the same distance as a companion cylinder. If they do, we can inspect the valves. I'm also gonna remove the exhaust manifolds because I want those out of the way when we install the engine. And we don't know if we're gonna use the truck manifolds or if we're gonna to have to get headers or manifolds off of another car. So I'm gonna start ripping stuff off of this. Once I get enough stuff off, then we can do some more testing and see why that cylinder had lower compression. Now I got the engine on the ground so I can get this chain off of here. I'm gonna pull the intake so I can inspect the knock sensors. Um, I'm gonna yank the coils off. Some of this stuff, I wanna clean up the uh, aluminum valve covers and the stuff on the front of the engine a little better. So I'm gonna pull the coils off as well. This valve cover I might remove so I can check the lift on that one cylinder that had lower compression. I'm gonna take off these exhaust manifolds. If you don't have your spark plugs off already, I would go ahead and take those off now. Um, unhook the wires, get the plugs out of the way because when we unbolt this, it is possible for the manifold to drop down and break the plugs. Uh, we also have to remove the dipstick because it goes through the manifold. This didn't have any broken bolts that I have to worry about drilling out or extracting. Whether I use these manifolds or another set of manifolds, I am gonna replace these bolts because they are prone to breakage. So the dipstick is a 15 millimeter. The exhaust manifold bolts, if they're the factory bolts, are a 10 millimeter. Sometimes the aftermarket bolts will have a 13 millimeter head. While I'm on this side and I have the 10 millimeter on my impact, I'm gonna take the coil bracket off of this side. I'm just gonna unplug this bulkhead. This goes to all the coils and then we need to detach this one loom because the injector wiring harness runs across here as well. And then we don't have to unbolt each individual coil. The whole thing will come off as an assembly. Take that off. And then we'll pull all of these bolts out. They do have a stud sticking out the top, so you have to use a deep well socket. And you can see here, it's dirty underneath the coil. That is a good indication that the junkyard did steam clean this. I'm gonna go to the other side, do the same thing, unhook the exhaust. The valve cover, those are all eight millimeter bolts. Now I can hook the jump pack back up and we can crank this engine over and make sure the rocker arms are moving about the same distance as the other ones. So they appear to be moving the same amount of distance. This exhaust right here, I have a little bit of play in the rocker arm. The, the lifter is partially collapsed. I got a little bit in the other one. It could just be a collapsed lifter from sitting for so long, and that might be why I built oil or built compression over time. I don't see any damage to the valve springs. The distance that it's traveling is about the same as the other ones or appears visually, I could put a dial indicator on it to know for sure, but I think we're gonna be okay.
So I was just cranking it over. I now have oil coming out the top of the push rod. And my slack is gone. So it, most of it anyways. So it probably pumped up that lifter a little bit once I built some oil pressure and now it's lubricating the upper valve train. So I'm gonna put the compression gauge back in and check this cylinder and see if it has gone up. So now that we know that the push rods are moving about the same as the rest of them, the camshaft's good. Um, it did take a little bit for this lifter to pump up and it may not be fully pumped up because sometimes you have to have the engine running at a higher RPM warmed up. But we'll see if we gained any compression. So we're still just under 150. I'm not gonna worry about it right now. Once we get the engine up and running, I may double check this cylinder. Um, I have a feeling that it's just a piece of carbon or something on a valve since the, when the lifter pumped up, it didn't change. And that's probably because it was the exhaust lifter that was collapsed partially. If it was the intake side, then we would have seen an improvement as more air could be drawn in. I'm gonna set this valve cover back on here and then we can pull the intake manifold off. Now the intake manifold bolts are right here next to the fuel rail. Those are all eight millimeter as well. So I'm just gonna zip all those out and then I'll unhook some of the wiring that's in our way. Now I'm gonna unhook some wires from the throttle body and then with the 10 millimeter socket, I'm gonna undo the throttle body because there's some coolant lines underneath that I don't feel like unhooking. So I normally just pull the throttle body, lay it to the front, and then I can remove the intake from there. We need to unhook the wiring harness from the alternator, the EVAP purge solenoid, and the injectors down both sides. To unhook the injectors, this gray tab is a locking tab. If you just slide it up, it only slides up less than a quarter of an inch. And then there's a black button on the connector. You push that in, kind of wiggle it, it'll come off. We're gonna do that down the line. If you can't, once you release it, if you can't push that button and get it to come off, then just go ahead and pull that gray tab all the way out. If you pull harder, it'll come up. You can push that black button further and then you can reset the locking mechanism, slide it in, but normally, Unless there's a lot of dirt in there, you can just uh, pull up on that and get these to release. And this is much easier to do right now on the floor than it is when it's in the vehicle. I've done dozens of these uh, intake manifold gaskets and not one of them has been this easy to access because you're normally reaching over the engine bay to get to everything. A few more things we have to take off. There's a plate here that holds the wiring harness down. There's a bracket here that the harness is taped to. Those are all 10 millimeters, so we're gonna zip those out. This connector right here on the side of the intake is for the knock sensors, so we're gonna unplug that, unclip this from the intake, and lay it down to the side. That harness runs underneath the manifold and connects to both knock sensors. Um, I already pulled off the PCV hose, went from here up to here. That hose is split up top, so I'll have to put a new hose there. Also gonna unplug the MAP sensor. The brake booster hose, since we're not in the vehicle, is already unhooked. Don't have to worry about that. Now I commonly see people taking the fuel rails off when they pull the intake manifold. It's just not necessary. The uh, fuel rail will come off with the intake, so don't do that unless you're changing injectors. Now I'm just gonna lay this harness off to the side of the intake. 
we should be able to lift the intake straight up. If you're doing it in the vehicle, you might have a hose hooked up to this. This is for the EVAP system. Just removing some leaves so they don't fall down into the valves. So just looking down the ports, this one here has a little bit of rust on the valves. So when they washed it, there was probably a little bit of water that got on that valve. Um, it's probably nothing to worry about. That one had good compression. I don't see anything funky going on except for a little bit of carbon buildup. You can definitely see how much buildup is underneath here and how much they pressure wash the engine. So next we're gonna pull the wiring harness up out of the knock sensor holes and inspect that. Now I'm just gonna lift these rubber grommets up. The wire harness should slip through the middle of it. Don't force it because you will break the connector at the knock sensor. That one looks okay. I don't see any rust in there. It's normally the back one and this one's full of water. And the reason it's always the back one is this engine sits at an angle. So when the water comes in from the front, it just runs right back, hits that piece of foam in the back and it pulls up and slowly works its way past this grommet down the hole and ruins the knock sensor. That right there is not good. Um, I won't trust that knock sensor now. It's been sitting with water in there ever since the junkyard pressure washed the engine. Did they pressure wash it right before they brought it to me or did it sit in the warehouse for a while and then they pressure washed it again? It's not worth the risk. I don't want to have to pull the intake manifold up again. I'm just going to order new knock sensors and a harness. And there's also a service bulletin for this. Um, when I change that out, I'll show you guys what you need to do to make sure this doesn't happen again um, because it is a common problem. Thanks for watching guys. I'm going to cut it here for now. In this episode, I dug deeper into that cylinder that had low compression. I don't think it's a major issue. Um, now that I cranked the engine over for a while, it is close to the other cylinders. It's about 10 pounds lower. The valves have a little bit of carbon on them. So I'm suspecting that one of those pieces of carbon is reducing the compression in that hole. Once I get the engine in the vehicle and drive it, if I notice any misfire or rough idle, then I will go ahead and pull that plug and double check compression in that hole. At least we know that that cylinder had lower compression to begin with so we can go straight to that cylinder if we have a problem once we get it running. Um, I pulled the intake manifold. We saw that water that was sitting on top of that knock sensor. That knock sensor is ruined. So I'm gonna replace the knock sensors and the harness, and then I'm going to do the service bulletin that helps prevent water from getting in there. I'll show you guys that in the next video. Also, I'm gonna clean up the valve covers, clean up that intake valley, get that all spotless. And then we still have some other stuff to do this engine. We have a oil pan to put on out of one of the cars. So I'll have that video coming up. We have wiring harness modifications to do. I will probably get the engine in the engine bay before I do any wiring modification because I want to know exactly where everything's gonna sit to see if I have to extend any of the harness how much I have to shorten parts of the harness. That's gonna be much easier to do once the engine's in the engine bay. I can just lay the harness onto the engine, kind of mock up what I need, and then take it back out, cut it apart, remove what I don't need, shorten or lengthen pieces, and then put some new wire loom on there. I ordered some new split loom that will dress it up a little bit from the factory setup and make it presentable under the hood of the Impala. If you guys are following along in this build, then great. If you just visited, I have some other videos before this one showing what we've done up to this point. If you want to see the rest of it, subscribe and hit the bell. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next time.